Welcome to the Philip Wiley Show. Take a look behind the curtain of professional hacking and hear compelling discussions with guests from diverse backgrounds who share a common curiosity and passion for challenges and their job. And now, here's your host, offensive security professional, educator, mentor, and author, Philip Wiley. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Philip Wiley Show. Today I'm joined by John and, and Greg from White Knight Security. Uh, I found out about these guys from Hack Redcon, seeing some of the posts and stuff up there. They're doing some really awesome stuff and doing uh, the non, not what you'd see typically from pen testing and offensive security. They do some really cool stuff. So uh, got them joining today. So I'm very excited to have you gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, Phil. It's good to be here. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you guys. I see all the, the cool courses and stuff that y'all are running at Hack Redcon and, and Hack SpaceCon. So, yeah, this is going to be a fun conversation. Looking so when we it. start out, what I refer to when I bring the guests on, the introducers themselves, if you wouldn't mind each individually sharing your hacker origin story, kind of how you got started and kind of where you are and what you're doing today. So, Greg, why don't we start with you? Yeah, sure. So... I graduated from Grand Valley State University in 2009 with a liberal arts degree in political science. Uh, I had nothing to do with hacking. <laughs> uh, I went right into the military from 2010 through 2017. Um, I was a Green Beret for the Special Forces Group, so I did two years of training in the Special Forces Qualification course. Um, that was language training. That was SEER school. That was, that was small unit tactics, which is like starving in the woods, learning how to do am ambushes and reconnaissance. Uh, and then there's a cul culminating exercise called Robin Sage, where you put everything that you learned uh, during the SFQC together. And it's a rubric exercise where you infill and you teach what's called G's. Um, they simulate like a partner force. Um, and then we do like, we, we raided a house. Like it, it was kind of staged, but it was still a lot of fun. And then at the end, you get your green beret. So uh, after that, I did four combat deployments to the Middle East in quick succession. So Afghanistan 2013, I was a consultant for the DOD for um, a Saudi Arabia deployment, um, Iraq, and then Syria in 2016, excuse me. <clears throat> um, so my job in the teams was, um, I was the 18 ECHO, eight, the, 18, <coughs> the 18 designator means special forces and ECHO means communications. So uh, routing, switching, VoIP, cryptography, um, even like setting up the Wi-Fi, setting up the AFN so the guys can watch the Super Bowl while being deployed. That was all me. So I would say that my hacker origin is just figuring out how, how things work, um, almost like by fuzzing them. Um, we use this thing called the Special Forces Deployable Node, the SDN. It comes in six boxes. I can basically take those six boxes anywhere on the planet. And as long as I can set it up and pushing, push the correct configuration to it, I can pull down um, nipper and sipper, which is um, high side and low side um, anywhere on the planet. So though this has a very steep learning curve. So I took copious notes um, because, you know, like something that takes 200 steps to configure, you're not gonna be able to remember it like under the gun, right? When all the, all the pressure's on. So I would say that's like where I first started getting into like, not like hacking is the, as we do now, but like just figuring out how, how to do things on my own, how things work. So um, de definitely developed a strong sense of persistence and grit while on the teams. Um, and then when I got out in 2017, I went right over to um, another boutique offensive cybersecurity consultancy company located right here in Grand Rapids. Um, and that's where actually where I met John, who, who's here. We worked on a bunch of cool projects. Uh, we did some consulting with Microsoft. We worked with Activision trying to defeat the anti-cheat engine for Call of Duty. Um, I did all the testing for the Silence EDR product. Um, and we were also breaking into buildings at that time too. So physical access operations, physical pen testing, um, surreptitious entry, learning a lot of physical tooling, tons of fun. So um, Dr. Jared DeMott, who used to own Media Labs, he was one of those guys that was like, we'll take every single job that you have, like OT, <laughs> web app, mobile, we can do it all. And so the engineers are on the back, the back end, you're like, uh, I guess we'll just figure out how to do this now. Um, and then after that, uh, I went over to uh, Six Gen. I did some consulting with CISA and did some teaching at the NSA. And um, after after about a year of that, we started WhiteNet Labs. So WhiteNet Labs is basically a roll up of all the best TTPs and methodologies that John and I have learned over the years. Uh, we wanted to make like an apex predator 
of offensive cybersecurity companies. So we only hire the best and brightest, a um, lot of senior and principal level talent. We don't really have a lot of like entry level people at the company. So, but that's getting more into the company. I'll let John do his intro. Very cool. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks, Greg. That was good, man. So John Sterwell here. I have a unique background. So I'll start out um, quite interesting how, so Greg, you've heard something about this, but I don't think I've ever done this on a podcast before. So it's probably time now to really talk about it. So um, right around 16 and 17, um, you know, I was really big into gaming, right? Halo 2, you name it. And um, somehow I got spun up on a web page with MMAP. And um, it just took me down a deep, dark rabbit hole all the way down to the dark web and then back up. And um, I found different various tools, like how to run MMAP's port scans. I found the old Millworm. And I found Windows XP, SP2 exploits, you know, Windows 2000 exploits. There was Windows Me on there. Millworm was um, was kind of like where I've learned, like, you know, how to code. I wrote Perl and C. Those were my first two languages. And um, for my senior year, you know, I was still 17. And um, I took every um, – so I did a Votech as well. So I did, like, um, a Votech is like a – I don't know, it's a technology school, so half day high school, half day on um, Votech, and I was doing computer sciences. So half my day was already using computers. So then my other half a day, other than like a math and a reading, was all computer classes as well. So I was on a computer eight hours a day, like a job, just going to different classes, like web page. I took Office, and um, I, you know, I was able to automate those classes, like web page. I just found code online and automated that, and um, I might have might have or might not have gotten in trouble for hacking um, both schools at some point in my life. Um, and that's what started my cybersecurity career, uh, where you, know, you can't just go be a hacker at 17, it doesn't work that way, right? Um, so what do I do, right? My goal was like, you know, I realized, you know, I wanted to go to security, you know, IT, like what do I do? And um, honestly, I thought about it, I was like, you know what, I'll just start from the ground up. So I got my first IT help desk job. I, you know, I did a bunch of interns, internships as well. Um, worked at a Crawford County courthouse and, um, you know, my first gig was B-side financial and that was like sub mortgaging the banking sector that really got me like my feet wet. And, um, I'm a very fast learner. Um, and I was always able to like reconstruct the active directory as an IT help desk. You know, I still fix, I could fix, I fix PCs, you know, reprovision them. I kind of improve processes and, um, you know, help play like sysadmin, junior sysadmin. And then I played security lead for a while. And that's where my feet got really wet, like on the pen testing side, because you know, I was pen testing my own company. You know, as I was taking my OSCP and then my OSCE as well, because I'm one of the one of the originals out there back in like 17, 18 era, you know, before everything changed. Um, you know, played CISO, you know, skill set for a while, did a, a ton of SOC 2, Type 2 audits, PCI, ISO. I did the NIST 853 version 3 or 4 at the time. When, you and know, you loved every second of it. And, um, you know, I, I realized, <laughs> you know, all the ACLs, all the firewall policies, and, you know, I got all the Palito experience. So I flew out, worked with Palito and worked with Traps, now called Cortex, you know. And, um, you know, I started really, really young and, um, I left all that. I was like, you know what? I'm done. <laughs> went right into pen testing, went right into pen testing. And, um, that was my calling. So that's where I met Greg and, you know, obviously, you know, Dr. Jared Mon as well. And that's, you know, was at VDA labs. And, um, team was really interesting back in the day because Greg made a good point. We took on all the different types of jobs. Like I never did mobile before that. I mean, I, I became an expert mobile tester. I tested so many mobile apps within, within a year. It was crazy. Same thing with web, you know, I was, I had my OSWE at the time or, or working on it with my certification and training course materials I just took off with web. Um, I even learned how to, you know, hack ATMs. We worked with Diebold directly on that. It was a really good project, you know, North American ATMs and Brazilian, you know, and we now use that skill set here in White Nail Labs. And then obviously as a pen tester, you know, I became senior level pretty fast and we moved in the Cobalt Strike and Red Team and that was my calling. I was like, boom, every, all my pen tests went straight off into, you know, how to be covert, how to be stealthy, you know, learning what the tools actually do and things like that. And um, I left VDA, and I still contracted on the side as I did this, but um, I went work for F-Secure. And then I, um, I I led the U.S. Red Team and also the, um, the internal pen test side, and I worked with the U.K. Red Team as well. And we tested two of the Fortune 10s um, across the world um, for um, two different two different countries there, U.S. and, and um, also for the U.K. area, which is really good. Um, and that just took my Red Teaming career off the map. Um, built infrastructure. You know, the guys over there are very skilled and, you know, very, very high-leveled. But the interesting thing about F secure now called with secure is the only test fortune 500 or above, right? It's not typical. There's no small, small, small shops, right? So you can have the mature shop, but <clears throat> excuse me, when company is that big, there's, there's holes everywhere. Right. So, um, I really liked what the team was doing, but, um, you know, after talking with Greg, I was like, you know what, we can do better. We can build a better team. We can do better TTPs and we can really help our clients out a lot better. And that was kind of the birth of one labs. So I left F secure. 
Um, and then me and Greg got together and we built one day laps. Um, and that's, you know, now we have a 30 man team, you know, we have a really nice red team, you know, teams all across every vector you could think of. And, um, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of, kind of how we're at now, what, four or five years in with a, with a steady team going forward. So, yeah, those are some very cool stories. I haven't heard F secure in a while. And also too, green beret. I haven't heard him when mentioned green berets in a long time, you know, used to back in like the seventies and eighties, you heard, about the Green Berets, they were the badasses. You know, really before everybody started hearing about Navy SEALs, it was the Green Berets, you know, the special forces that were, were really cool. So it's kind of cool to, to see someone your age that was a Green Beret because I hadn't heard, heard any, that term in a long time. Yeah, usually people, uh, when I say Green Beret, their, their response is, oh, like a Navy SEAL? But no, <laughs> not like a Navy SEAL. <laughs> it's funny that anyone that's been around for a while would know that the Green Berets were the thing before, before the Navy SEALs really took off, you know? Yep. Yeah. So very cool background. So very cool. The kind of stuff you guys are, you guys are doing. So is that mainly what you specialize is in, uh, red teaming and, uh, physical or. Yeah. So in 2023, we spent most of the year building the web application API team. And now we've got about 20 web app and API testers, um, and then the first half of 2024, we were, we were building out the embedded team, and now we're working on building out the ATM, hacking, and OT team. So um, I would say that the vast majority of our work is still internal external penetration testing, web app, API, and cloud, just because that's where pretty much every company needs those things, as opposed to a red team engagement where these are the most mature, most secure companies, sometimes Fortune 500. Um, that's typically the, where we see red team engagements like, you know, they, they're already doing hardware inventory. They're doing software inventory. They have a, um, a mature vulnerability scanning program. They've been penetration tested five times or more, and there's no more critical or high findings. Only then is it like, okay, you're probably ready for a red team engagement, but the vast majority of the companies that we've partnered with are not ready for red team engagement. So yeah. Yeah. that being said, yeah. we do, we still do red teaming. It's just not the, the, cool. the bulk of our work. Yeah, it's very understandable because, you know, trying to, to solely survive off of that, you may not get enough work. And then plus you don't want to get to where you're specializing in this. Maybe this is all you're doing. You've got a lot of work and then all of a sudden that drops off the need for this. And so de definitely understandable. Really cool that you offer a lot of things beyond what the typical consulting companies do because I don't hear of a lot of consulting companies that do ATM pen testing because when I was at U.S. Bank, we outsourced our ATM pen testing at first, but they end up bringing it in house, but trying to find companies that had experience in that area, there weren't very many. And then here you talk about the embedded stuff. That's kind of cool that you do that because, you know, most of what you see these days are people are doing web app and infrastructure pen tests. And that's pretty much it. They're really not offering the red teaming, you know, ATM pen testing and kind of hardware pen testing. So that's really cool. Offering yeah. That you have. And the embedded side, like everything is embedded, right? Like these headphones are embedded. Um, like this keyboard is an embedded device that I'm using as a mechanical keyboard. So, um, and then also on top of that, the FDA pushed on regulations in March of 2023, that if you want to bring an embedded medical device to market, it actually has to be penetration tested, uh, go through an embedded penetration test, and there has to be a software build materials. So like that, that widget that connects to the internet, that API has to be tested, the cloud backend has to be, has to be all those resources have to be inventoried. If there's a mobile app that has to be pen tested. So we've seen just a wave of all this medical embedded work uh, come out of that. Very cool. Thinking of the, all that, all those types of pen tests, one of the coolest conferences I've been to for like hacking opportunities was Black Hat Middle East in Africa last November. They had like an embedded hacking village, a medical device hacking village, uh, IoT, just about anything you could think of. The CTF there alone was about the size of two football fields end to end. There were a, a thousand people on site Whoa. playing the CTF. So it was kind of cool to see all those opportunities to to hack all those different types of devices that you normally don't see. Yeah, that's really interesting. I only see CTFs that scale at like NorthSec. Um, so two football fields of just an embedded CTF, it, it's pretty impressive. That's an, that's yeah, that was just crazy. a general CTF. It wasn't embedded CTF, but they did have an embedded CTF is one of the CTFs there. So very cool, the stuff you're, stuff you're doing there. So if someone's wanting to get out on, and yeah, before I get further, how about uh, have you guys explain the difference between red teaming and pen testing? Because there's so much 
confusion in the industry. And you hear sometimes consulting companies say that when they should know better, but I think they're just trying to speak to the audience in some cases, but there's a lot of uh, confusion on the difference between a pen test and a red team operation. Yeah, sure. So I'll take this. So um, there's the main difference between a penetration test and a red team engagement is that a penetration test, think of it like a smash and grab. It's typically time box to one or two week, um, to, to one or two weeks, depending on the size of the network. And we're being very loud in the network. We're running tools like Eyewitness, Nmap, Nessus, Bloodhound. Um, we don't really care if the blue team sees us. Um, we have very lim limited time. So all, all we're trying to do is find misconfigured systems, unpatched systems, um, you know, we're running the vault scanner to find like the low hanging fruit. Um, but this, essentially the goal is to find active record misconfigurations and then pivot to or escalate to domain admin, dump the NTDS.did, get those hashes cracking in our GPU powered uh, hash, crack, uh, hash cracker in um, AWS. Um, a red team engagement is very different in that it's it's objective focused, it's mission focused, right? Like what is the operate, what is, it's almost like military operation, right? Like we're planning to do one or two things. Um, if we're doing a red team engagement for Microsoft, a couple of, a couple objectives could be like to break, maybe like gain surreptitious entry to Microsoft headquarters, um, gain access to source code, put a backdoor in their CDI CD pipeline, um, maybe get strategic plans for the new Xbox coming out, things like that, as opposed to, Let's find all the misconfigurations and unpatched systems of the Microsoft network because they're already doing that, right? It's Microsoft, so they have a massive security budget. So it's more like, what can we do to bring this company to their knees, um, hinder their competitive advantage, et cetera? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. What really, really uh, a story I like to share was I used to work, I was a red team lead for a global consumer product company, and it probably was just about a few months back that I kind of realized that when I got hired on, to be the red team lead, I really don't even think the CISO really knew what a red team was. Mm -hmm. I came in to build a red team. This was my intentions, getting Cobalt Strike licenses, building out my internal infrastructure and some cloud infrastructure. And then they're wanting all these different pen tests done. But we had this new director that got hired on and he was wanting a red team operation done against the SAP app. <laughs> <laughs> so Which you might have one application yeah. penetration test. Yeah. Yeah. But that's just kind of the stuff you see. It was kind of kind of ridiculous to see what people see and think sometimes. Yeah, and you see some of the books, some of the books that come out too that they mislabel stuff, so it causes a lot of confusion. But thanks for for sharing your your view of that. Do you have anything to add to that, John? No, I think Greg covered it pretty good. Right? It's funny though. I'll give you a little story. It's like we um, when we um, try to hire people for red teaming, it's like I have to ask like nine questions before I can even take an interview. It's like. When someone says, oh, yeah, I've done 350 red team engagements. I'm like, no, no, you haven't. <laughs> Think about it. I mean, an average red team takes between, what, six, 12 weeks. I mean, you'd have to be you'd have to be red teaming longer than I have. Yeah. So and then it's like it's pretty unheard of. You know, no one no one's been red teaming for, for 25 years, you know, at a true covert operation level. So when I see guys that say, hey, I've, I've done 23 different red teams, it's like, OK, now that's a little bit believable, you know, because typically, you know, we average four to six a year. You know, and if, that, if you're running a two-man team, you know, that's that's almost the whole year, right? With a little bit of research time, you know, build about 75%. So that's a typical what you'd see probably for, for a full-time red teamer back-to-back. -back. So Yeah, it, it's very hard to, to find and hire seasoned, experienced operators for red teams that can operate independently. Um, they have to have a mix of networking background, web application, mm -hmm. penetration testing background, software development in native code, and typically another language like... Golang or, or .NET, like C-sharp or something. Um, so we have a lot more web app and API and cloud folks at WKL than red teamers, just because it is so hard to find that perfect like engineer that can do all the things. Yeah, and let's not talk about them also needing Cobalt Strike experience, because you know we're seeing a mass people leave Cobalt Strike or don't even have the experience. I've never even used it before. So you know when we have red, when we need red teamers, it's like. Oh yeah, we've never used a C2 before. We have very limited C2 experience and it's not going to cut it, right? We need people that can just, you know, immediately just walk into Cold Strike or some kind of C2 framework and know what to do, right? Have evasion techniques, things like that. Because when, when, we, when we red team, you know, we're not just like, oh, we're going to run, you know, a few tools here and things like that. No, we work as a team, we operate as a team, we act like a military unit. Like we're, we're a full cover operation. So That's cool because that's, you know, that's the kind of the way nation states operate and that's kind mm -hmm. of the way we need to operate. So for We've been labeled as a nation state. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 
no, I was gonna say we've been labeled as a nation state where we make our traffic look like nation state actors or, or simulate cool. ATPs in certain fashions yeah. as best we can. So, but that's the goal. So, folks called us an APT. I was like, no, <laughs> come <Man>. on, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, very cool. So, mm-hmm. someone wanting to get into red teaming because there's a lot of folks out there sharing information on how to get into pen testing. There's all sorts of courses and stuff. But if someone wanted to get into the red teaming side, what's kind of the learning path that you'd recommend? Ooh. Greg, you want to go or you want me to go? Yeah, so they're, they're starting from nothing and you want me to make them a red teamer. Um, yes. I think that coming from either system administration or software development background is a great starting place. If you work at sysadmin and you're like at a Fortune 500 company and you're pushing out like web, app, web apps um, within the enterprise at the enterprise level, or you're configuring like GPOs and Active Directory for like a 10,000 employee organization, that's going to give you a really strong foundation to stand on. But at the same time, you're going to be missing the software development piece that's required for red teaming. Um, so on, on the flip side, if you come from a software development background, like native code, like C, C++, Rust, Golang, .NET, you basically can write all the tooling that's needed for the job, but you're, you're going to be missing that fundamental layer where like how do enterprise networks actually operate? Like where, where are the holes that we can look for, et cetera. Um, so what I would, I would start like either in software development or sysadmin, John came from the sysadmin background. I came from a very unique background that was like neither, neither one more sysadmin <laughs> than software development. Um, and then from, from there, it's just being really curious. So like you still have to learn the networking piece for when you, when it comes time to pivot between multiple machines, um, you still have to understand how the cloud works. So we typically use, um, a mix of AWS and Azure for, um, for our cloud routing operations, like second infrastructure, et cetera. And then John actually wrote an entire course around this called the Advanced Red Team Operations course, which um, someone could take that course that is coming in as like a, maybe a senior penetration tester, but they want to pivot into red teaming. So John, hit the course basically lays the entire foundation of, okay, so this is how you use CDNs as redirectors. This is how you stand Cobalt Strike, use beacons, et cetera. But we have another course called Offensive Development, which is just the software development piece. So that's writing loaders and assembly and native code. Um, you're learning about AMSI, you're learning about ETW, you're learning about driver development, um, how to sideload DLLs, et cetera, for like execution persistence. Um, that being said, there there's really no like college degree to be a red teamer. But if someone wanted, if someone like was being forced to to go the academic traditional route, I would recommend just plain Jane computer science degree. Something that like you're in the weeds, learning assembly, programming, how operating systems work and how networking works. Um, a lot of schools are offer, are offering cybersecurity degrees and computer science degrees. I've noticed that the cybersecurity degrees are typically less rigorous and more GRC focused. Um, I would not go that route if someone wanted to be a hands-on operator. John, you, you got anything? No, it was good, yeah. So a sysadmin background or some kind of networking background is preferred. Um, honestly, I'll never even take it someone on who, who doesn't have any pen testing experience. Most, almost all of our, our red teamers have come back, come from a background of pen testing, right? And pen testing allows you to kind of flesh out your errors, kind of take down a net client network as time goes on, you know, find misconfigurations, active directory, kind of really explore, you know, different attack paths. Cause that's what a red team is, right? It's, you know, it's not 30 attack paths. It's one very sophisticated attack path that lets you get to your objective. And a lot of people think, you know, when they come to the red team, it's like, oh, I'm going to get domain admin that's like a third or fourth objective of us, maybe not even on the objective list. The primary objective of a red team is to get the PII, PHI data or access some kind of projects or something that would cripple the business to the knees. If, if there's a client list in this podcast, you know I use that exact same verbiage, cripple the business to the knees. How do I stop you from making your money? A lot of people came in, you know, a lot of people who work for a company can't even answer, how does that co- company generate revenue? That's like the most important question that everybody, every person should know at a company they work for. How does a company make money, right? And as a red team operator, you know, your, your goal is to, to evaluate how that happens and then how do I cripple that? How do I take it down? So, and that's really important. So I expect every every red teamer come from pen testing, have, have at least worked three to five years in pen testing. And then you can start really like, you know, every time you do a pen test, treat it like a covert operation, try not to get caught, you know, spin up a C2. I know that's extra work on the side, but that's what's going to build your skill set, right? And then obviously, you know, having certificates or certs that, you know, are relevant industry, industry relevant, right? Such as like, Certified red team professional, certified red team expert. I expect some AD knowledge along with setting up redirectors. Like, our, sure, our course is great. Um, I would say it's probably not beginner friendly. Um, maybe, um, Greg, what's that course by Ross and Mouse? Um, certified red um, team operator. Yeah, operator one yeah. and two. Those are great courses. 
So give him a shout out. That's great. So those are good courses. I hear a lot of people like those ones. Those are great. Um, personally, TCM I didn't. TCM also has courses on like everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, Honestly, I, I, we yeah. took we took we both took the OSCP, and I was not impressed. Unfortunately, that was just one sort of didn't didn't think that was really industry re- relevant. Um, so, sure, if you want your OSCE, take it. Um, but I think there's better search out there for around red team experience. Um, I will know, say that for for web application penetration testers, what I really like to see is the OSWE. If someone has the mm-hmm. OSWE, they can come in, they can read source yep. code in multiple languages, they can develop exploits based off the source code review. Um, they go way beyond like the burp active scan, go, like just press go yeah. easy button. So yeah, yeah, it's it's hard guys because like you know we talk about okay cool I have a redirectors course okay cool I taught you how to build redirectors infrastructure that's awesome you know we have an offensive development course okay great we taught you how to bypass AVDR you know build some loaders and you know maybe some reflective stuff cool you don't know anything about lateral movement you don't know anything about event logs or what's generated by Splunk or whatever soft solution blue teams monitoring you know you have no idea about that right. So if you have, you've never done a web application pen test before, how are we getting in? Where's our foothold going to be, right? You know, most people don't have any fishing experience or don't know how to pick up a phone and call someone and actually, you know, try to break it or, you know, give them access inside, right? So getting the initial, you know, initial foothold is quite, is quite crucial. So what we've developed is not everyone can do everything. So when we build our red team out, we have one guy who's really good at fishing or can pick up the phone, right? Or just he's all really, you know, really easy to going, really outgoing, really easy to talk to. We have another guy who's just phenomenal EDR bypasses. We have another guy who's just comes from a blue team background, knows the event logs, knows that we can do this and we can't do that, right? Knows, has gone up against ATP, has worked for Microsoft directly, and things like that. So when we build a red team, it's just not one skill set. There's, we, we're, we're a team, like a special forces team. So we're all good at something. And we combine our efforts together. So, and that seems to work out. So. Philip, yeah, I know there's like a 15 minute answer and like, it's, why it's, don't, a, like it's, a, it's a hard how question. How do you do this? It's a hard question though. <laughs> it's a hard question. So yeah. this, is, this is great stuff. It's always good to hear people's perspectives because one, one thing too, and I, you know, I respect his opinion and this is like one of the first people I kind of followed is Mubix said a while back, I saw one of his talks at a conference and his opinion was pen testers don't make good red teamers, but that's, you know, that's kind of his opinion. And, but everyone's got their different opinions and stuff. And you guys mentioned having the pen testing background and I kind of have to, to lean more towards that myself because getting that hacking experience when you're talking about red team operations on the short side, taking six to 12 weeks for one operation, how many times you get the opportunity to exploit things when you're only trying to find one exploit to get your foothold. And so with the pen testing, you're getting to do a lot of exploitation. So you're getting to do that over and over again and get that ingrained before you try to move on to where you, like you said, you only just need that one good exploit to make a foothold. Yeah, you know, yes, penetration what's... testing is, is great for getting reps in because like even on that red team, like you're still going to move laterally, like maybe using like AD, ADCS. There's still a lot of overlap. Go ahead, John. I cut you off. No, I was going to say a lot of these, a lot of guys coming in and doing red team and think it's like all this goriness, right? Honestly, I'll, I'll be honest with you guys. Red team sucks. It straight sucks. It is, <laughs> it is grueling. It is like data intensive. And what I what do I mean by that? You're not going to walk into a network. You're not just going to pop you know, escalation one for ADCS. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You're going to get busted all day long, right? Even if you do generate the cert, the PFX, you're not going to be able to authenticate with it, right? Even over LDAP, I could go on and on about how it's not going to work. You know, you could tell me how you're going to evade all this stuff. Honestly, what I prefer you do is when we do get an initial foothold, you're going to set up a SOX 5 server and you're going to get on all the file shares. You're going to try to identify all the data and complete objectives one through three, right? You're going to be on file shares for a week. It is grueling. It is terrible. You're going to try to escalate privileges by just getting passwords or looking for clear text data or something that they've given or on a file share. That's the way in because honestly, detecting file share enumeration at a very slow pace is very difficult. A lot of clients and a lot, even mature clients struggle with that. If we're not, if we're not hitting DLP policies, we're not extracting anything on that network, we're probably never going to see it, right? So if we look, if, we, if we're just, you know, the whole, whole idea is to blend in and blending in is looking at file shares, right? That's, that's a common thing we do. Looking at Confluence, looking at Jira, you know, setting up SOX proxies and actually just authenticating with a normal user and accessing normal app, app web applications or internal web applications. So web, web application, you know, for red team is just looking at the code, looking at what's happening. And then let's not talk about the one week reporting requirements afterwards that for 110, 115 page report, that's also the most worst part of possible. So yeah, red team kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So to, to, to piggyback on what John just said, like everyone thinks that being a red teamer is super like gratifying and there's just a lot of glory around like everyone wants to be red teamer no one wants to be blue teamer right um also 
everyone wants to do physical access operations and physical pen testing and breaking buildings. Well, let me tell you about one that I just did, Philip. Uh, <laughs> not only, so it was, it was two two-man teams. There was four of us total. We were in two different vehicles. And I was on the recce team because that's my background. And um, me and Dave, we were rolled up by security. The security is like sauce on the exterior camera that we were just sitting in a vehicle, keeping eyes on the security guard while John and Kurt were trying to keep, were, were trying to break in the back of the building. But there was a roaming security guard. It's so like we had to have eyes on 24 seven so they didn't get rolled up, right? Well, after we got caught, we had to leave the premises. So uh, Dave and I, we go across the street and my, I'm looking at Google Maps and there's there's woods right across the street from the client. I'm like, okay, we're gonna hide those woods with binos so we can still keep eyes on the security guard. That way, John and Kirk can still achieve, um, be, be successful uh, for the operation. Those woods were full of downed trees, poison ivy, and thorns. Things that you can't see until you're actually on the ground. So it's 1 a.m. Dave and I, Dave has a bad knee, by the way, we are, we are low crawling through poison ivy in the middle of the night. And the mosquitoes are bad, we're covered in ticks, but we finally got eyes on the objective and we can see the security guard. So I think we tell that story, like from here on out, when everyone thinks that physical access operations are awesome and like this thing to put up on a pedestal, we've had so much misery that like anyone else can have it. I, I don't want it. <laughs> yeah, it's very interesting. Kind of makes me think of uh, Nolicon. I was at Nolicon a few, way, a few weeks back and had a really cool panel with some red teamers. So uh, Init80 from Dual Core was there. Oh, nice. And Pyro was there. Uh, Init80's wife, Maria, she was there telling her stories as well as some other gentlemen. I forget his name, but they had some really cool stories and talking about the crawling through the mud and just the different rough trains and stuff was kind of one of the one of the the re reoccurring topics that came up during their them sharing their stories it's funny um a lot of people would be physical you know they think about getting caught by police or getting you know handcuffed by police but until it happens either you can handle or you can't so you know one thing that greg left out is um we had a very very high police engagement in this one where they shut down the entire highway for us Oh, wow. And um, we've had, you know, me, me and Kurt, you know, and he was shadowing. It was his first time shadowing with us. And, um, you know, his first response was um, he, he handled very well. Don't run with Kurt's listening. He did a very good job. I couldn't expect anything better um, as a WTL guy, you know, very good. But um, we had some ARs and some pistols pointed at us and we were ripped out of the car. So um, it happens, right? So obviously, you know, if it's happened to you before, you stay very calm, things like that. But, you know, that, that's a possibility, right? Because you know, you are doing a physical pen test and, you know, there is active security on site and they reported us and they saw us and, um, you know, they worked with the police to catch us and it was their job. So and it was a I high security was facility. A, I bet that was a tough one to, 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 uh, get across to law enforcement. Yeah, it was, it, it was a difficulty, but you know, law enforcement at the end of the day, they know what we do and what we're trying to prove here. And like I said, it was a high security facility. You know, they're protecting, yeah. um, I'm not going to disclose the information, but they're protecting something yeah. very critical to America. So, um, which is very important. So, um, the client and the police are both satisfied with the, with the outcome. So, yeah, when it comes to anything nations, uh, you know, national infrastructure, those are kind of the outcomes, I guess you kind of really want to see as, as a citizen, I mean, you're wanting to be successful, but you really want, want to go see all these facilities where anyone can come in do whatever. And it wouldn't make you feel very comfortable trying to sleep at night, knowing what all could happen out there. Yep. Yep. So what about one of the things I always get people asking me about is how to get started in physical. Is there any good courses you can recommend for the physical security side? Because it's just one of those things you rarely see at conferences even, but uh, I have a lot of people always asking. Yeah. So there's like the education piece with the only physical course I know, uh, there's covert access team and then Travis Weathers of Optiv right. just set up another team or, or another course. So there, there's two, two courses there. And then as far as kit, um, Travis Weathers also has like a kit that he sells on the side. It, it is pretty expensive. Um, if you're just getting into physicals, I would get like an under the door tool, double door tool, um, and then like a, two or three airbags. That'll probably get you around the vast majority of things that you're gonna have to do. Probably get a Williams key as well, so you can load locks. Um, you don't have to really break the bank. You know, if you, if you wanna get a badge cloner, get a badge cloner, um, pro but probably not necessary. Yeah, yeah, I, I know a lot of people argue with that point that, uh, Oh, you should be cloning badges. You should be interacting with people, stealing badges. And honestly, um, physicals are becoming less and less common because of budget constraints. 
especially around a lot of clients. So if you can go on site for two or three days and um, you don't need a badge cloner, you don't have to interact with people or, or things like that, right? And you could just get in by, you know, lock wooding or, um, you know, by you know, interacting or tailgating with, with the cleaning crew and things like that. Um, I would say 99% of all of our festivals, we do not have to clone a badge. Um, we could just walk right into the building, um, even at nighttime operations, um, bypass alarms or do anything like that, right? And um, we're free roam. Honestly, like most people, you know, most of the rooms aren't protected. They're not fully caged. Under the dual tool works, or we can lock void it, or we can airbag it, or do something like that. And we don't cause any destruction. So um, we, we've done, we, we, me and Greg have both done tons of physicals, um, probably over at least 30 by now together, maybe 40. And I know some of those guys are like, all oh, that small numbers. We're not, remember, we're not doing physicals all day long, every day of the week. So, but um, yeah, we do enough of them. It's definitely a niche thing. Yeah, definitely a niche thing. But, um, you know, it's, um, it's hard, right? So, I know Travis has a really good course, and a lot of it's based around badges, right? I think that's what it is. And um, he's a really good kit. We actually plan to buy one of his kits um, this year to start actually incorporating some badge testing around our sides. But um, honestly, the best way to get experience is look at all the first responder tools, build yourself a, t- a kit. Um, I do like key bumping. Um, I, you know, that's really fun as well. You know, I am pretty good at lock picking. I, I've picked a lot of six pin locks. Um, but remember, the, the key thing is, like, I tell a lot of guys are surprised. Lock picking is the last resort because you pick open a lock, you have to pick it closed too. A lot of people don't realize that. So that's all I'm going to lock, pick my way in. It's like, no, you're not. And you're also going to be standing <laughs> no. at that door for a while. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> yep. So that's yeah, how it goes. Cool. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because you hear some of the stuff like Devi and Olam talking about on his videos and his talks and stuff talking about, you know, it's easier most cases to try to get in other ways than trying to pick a lock to get in. Yep. He's 100% correct. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. And the, the first responder kit or ideas is pretty interesting i never heard anyone mention that so that's that's kind of a good reference you always hear the tools and stuff but you really don't ever hear uh that being referenced so that's that's awesome so what about uh so we're getting down close to the to the end of the show and just have a few more things before we wrap up what do you guys think about assume breach is that something you guys practice in in your services or uh, I, know I think that Zoom Breach is, is great. It's, well, we used to market them as mini red team operations and no one got that what that was. So we either call them Assume Breach or instead of threat assessments now. Uh, it's basically, it is a mini red team engagement, right? We're basically doing an objective, objective focused engagement that we don't have to start from the external. We're starting internal. So we can still, you know, we can start from a beacon. We can start from like a company laptop with VPN credentials. Um, anywhere we're already where we're already on the internal network and then it's still going after clear text credentials on file share going after blueprints strategic advantage once again that that red team focus where we want to hurt the business and bring the company to its knees yeah cool. my favorite my favorite thing about that is um the insider so we, we call them insider threat assessments like i think one of our bread and butters for that one is um the company treats, treats like a new hire so we'll we'll get a laptop shipped to the house like we're under a fake name with the company through hr and there's only a few people that know and um, you know how how far can we go without someone picking us up? I mean, think about it. we we have valid credit, we have a valid laptop, VPN configuration, or Citrix or whatever they've given us, and um, we generate you know real traffic. Like we have a job, like they give us roles, responsibilities. We we do as well, even though we're not getting paid, we're actually like a real employee. And um, you know, it's typically three weeks, fifteen days straight through. And um, you know, how far can we go? And a lot of clients are blown away at you know what we've accomplished. A good story is um we have a dude on, on our team um who's so detailed oriented that he found credentials inside um, a four minute video that a, a software developer dropped on a file share. And I'll be honest, I'm not looking through videos for credentials, guys. It's not, it's not happening. It was, not, it was an it's not me. HR video and he <laughs> yeah. watched the whole thing. I watched the whole thing and then actually found credentials in a video. And, and that's a true red team at heart right there. If I can wow. ever say one. So impressive. You know, that's kind of interesting. That brings up, cause I, we didn't really get into that, but that brings up a good, uh, a good way to leverage AI if you were able to scan through videos and pull out information like that. So you're not stuck watching a video for all that time. Cause like Daniel Meisler has something he wrote called fabric that will, you can go through and you can pull all the knowledge or, or forget what he calls it to pull from the, the videos, but to get all the key points and knowledge from that video, you can run YouTube videos through it, get the key points and all that and summarize it without and watch a two or three hour, you know, video. So if someone could create some tool or use leverage AI to look for any kind of content that way, so you're not having to spend all that time looking yep. through videos, but that awesome that great. you had someone to do that. Otherwise it would have been missed. Yeah. The biggest thing about AI guys is that um, it's coming, 
the only thing that we need is secure servers. If we could use AI with a secure server, we know the data is not going to like to the open AI network. You know, there's no problem putting client data in there. But right now it's like, it's a strict no-no with client data and AI, right? Yeah. So we don't, trust me, we, we have an open AI um, you know, subscription. We, we pay for the top AI, you know, we, we use various sources, but um, policy is no client data inside AI right now. So That's until good. we can ha- until we know that we can have, you know, client servers or secure servers that we know where the data is going. So. Yeah, don't be those Samsung developers that just like put source code for <laughs> Samsung right there. Yeah, <laughs> or the Amazon policy <laughs> procedures. I love that one too. <laughs> yeah, that's the the bad thing about the AI is just anyone can access it, and put whatever in there. And people that are outside of people's security can be bad enough, but people outside of security are not going to think twice about what they're putting in. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. So we're getting down towards the end of the show. Is there anything you guys like to share before we end the episode? So the, there's, there's basically two big pieces of White Net Labs. There's the education piece, and then there's the services piece. We really covered the services piece um, in detail. But on the education side, we have three main courses, offensive development, um, advanced rate team operations, and then Ron Ack and Chirag's course called Offensive Azure Operations and Tactics. Offensive development is all about loader development. Um, you know, we're teaching students, we're, we're kind of like going over like the last five years of, of offensive security from using um, direct system calls to call Windows APIs, then went to indirect system calls, and now we're actually building the stack, we're spoofing the stack and created custom assembly uh, at runtime. So we do that, tons of assembly, tons of data code, .NET code. Uh, we teach them how to like use proxy DLLs for persistence and execution, how to bypass AMZ, ETW, how to write um, beacon object files from scratch for Cobalt Strike. And that lab environment is super impressive. It actually has multiple fully licensed EDR products. It comes with a fully licensed Cobalt Strike. Um, and they'll let John talk about the ARTO course. Yeah, so the ARTO course is pretty cool. So i um, super excited for this one. So I basically wrote the Advanced Rate Team Operations course. And the idea behind it was they teach people, te- people about infrastructure and um, redirectors. And then um, that's day one. Um, and day one's like super advanced, super hard. It's, um, it's not a joke. A lot of people are like, wow. Like, we, take, we teach them how to basically protect their Cobalt Strike server with Apache rewrite rules, um, you know, checking for custom HP headers and things like that. And, um, you know, basically how to keep your red, red team infrastructure alive for a long time. Like, we, we we always have an internal joke, like the longest running red team server for Cobalt Strike right now for us is three years. We have a three-year server that's been running and has never been caught inside AWS. Oh, wow. It's just because we, we protect it. We've, in the, the same way I protect it is the same way I teach the guys. Now, there's a few other things that we do as well. Um, day two is basically an operations day. So you take everything you built from day one and use it against day two. And we take you through an attack path. We actually handhold you. So you'll, you, you'll go through like a web application. Um, you'll get RCE. You find um, various, there's, there's a lot of different things in there. Um, about total 20, 21 labs. And we're always adding to it. So it's hyper current as best we can. Um, so as we go, and that's a cool thing. It's taught live. And then you get access to labs um, 30 days. You get access to Cobalt Strike. Um, you know, it's very, it's, it's limited. Like you don't get root access to the server. It's just limited right? based on Fortress policies, right? That we have. And then um, based on the feedback we got from the ARTO, um, it's been really good feedback is I'm, we're creating another course now um, that's just talking about infrastructure automation and redirectors. So it's going to take day one um, of the ARTO and we're going to spin it. And it's another 16 to 20 labs of just gruesomely re- learning about infrastructure and redirectors. Gruesome. And then another, sp- <laughs> and then another spinoff of the ARTO that I was just talking about with our other other guy was um, building a lateral movement class. So a course just on red team lateral movement because a lot of people struggle on setting up SOX proxies, understanding local port forwarders, reverse port forwarding, you know, setting up so- you know SOX TCP tunnels internally. Like what can we do DNS? All that kind of stuff, and actually moving laterally, and then actually you know you know not generating event logs or what's opsec friendly, what's not, right? And actually go up against ADR. So that's another one we're going to spin off on. So that's which is really cool. So. Oh, that's and then our and then our third course. I know we're we're just going. Um, it's called <laughs> Offensive Azure Operations and Tactics. And uh, Sharad Savlet and Ronick Parma wrote that. They're actually coming over. They came to WKL from Altered Security. They wrote the lab environments um, and certifications for a certified red team professional and certified red team okay. expert. And then the certified Azure red team professional, I think is what it's called. It's like cart, cart to, to, too many, uh, too many letters. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a two day training and that's going to be, uh, they run you through an intro to Azure uh, intro ID, um, running you through Azure access controls like RBAC, um, key vault access policy, enumerating Azure via unauthenticated and authenticated points of view. Um, automating enumeration, gaining initial foothold via 
Kubernetes, logic apps, um, app services, function apps, storage accounts. Um, and then they also do pivoting from on-prem to cloud and then cloud to on-prem um, via intra ID Connect, SSO, Steel and PRT. And then they run through maintaining persistence via service principles, automation accounts, ARC and hybrid connections. So um, it took them about three months to build the course and that comes to a fully functioning lab environment for the students. And there's also a CTF at the very end of the course. All of our courses end with like some kind of lab challenge that we don't get the answers to. Uh, we typically have the students two to three two to three weeks to complete the labs. Um, oh, that's nice. And then they, they just submit a report and if they do a good job, there's a monetary reward. Wow, that's awesome. Yep. <laughs> trying, yeah, trying Powerful. to incentivize our, our, our students to go to the extra mile, so. Yeah, that's very awesome. Because you hear some of the other courses where they have CTFs at the end and it's just whatever last half of the day or last day of the course or something, but it's pretty awesome to have that many weeks left to, to go through it. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for, for joining guys. This has been awesome. I'm sure the listeners are gonna love it and I can't wait wait to release it. So thanks for, for joining. Yeah, uh, Philip, uh, flattered that you invited us. Yeah, OG in the industry, you. it's it's great to be here. Yeah, may have to have, have, have to have you guys back again sometime. So thanks. Thank you. All right. Can do. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Philip Wiley Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In the meantime, to learn more about Philip, go to thehackermaker.com and connect with him on LinkedIn and Twitter at Philip Wiley. Until next time.